Hey, what's going on, Giants fans? Daryl Slater here with Bob Rook over the latest episode of our Giants Talk is Cheap podcast from NJ.com, the Star Ledger, NJ Advanced Media here coming to you guys on Wednesday of the bye week. We usually do this on Tuesday, but we wanted to wait to see what happened or didn't happen at the trade deadline. And so here now Wednesday during the bye week with the 6-2 and two Giants coming off the loss in Seattle. Obviously, this team gave themselves a bunch of wiggle room with a 6-1 and one start. Um and, you know, that and not the end of the world that they lose in Seattle. Tough place to play, very loud place. Uh, so here they are preparing for really the second half of the season, the final nine regular season games, uh, pushing for a playoff spot, obviously. And we could talk all about that and much, much more as we look ahead to the second half of the season. We recap, I guess, what they kind of really didn't do at the trade deadline. We'll talk a little bit about the Kadarius Tony trade uh, and about much more here. Uh, Bob, what's going on? Hello, Daryl. How are you? Um, you know, it was I was out in Seattle. It was it was not a great game for the Giants. Um, you know, maybe a little bit of a template for how to stop the Giants. If you can stop Dar- Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley, you got a good chance of winning. But as you said, it wasn't that game wasn't the end of the world. Um, the, they the, this team the bye week comes at a a great time for this team because they really really need to to rest up here. Uh, we're going by the trade deadline. Uh, we got a lot to talk about. We got a lot to talk about this week. So, yeah. So I, I think that's a good point. It does come at a great time. The essential midpoint of the season, coming off a long road trip out to the Pacific Northwest, and a chance for this team to get healthy, and they need to get healthy. And so we'll start. I guess we'll just we'll just go back to last week real quick. Since speaking of the trade deadline or the area around the trade deadline, the most notable thing that Joe Shane did was really like make one of the more notable trades in the NFL around this time. Uh, it perhaps has gotten overshadowed throughout the uh, past day or so by all the things that happened on Tuesday on deadline day, but Kadarius Tony traded to the Kansas city chiefs for a third round pick uh, and a sixth round pick. And again, just to be clear, this is an actual third round pick. There's no conditions to this pick. Uh, the chiefs are giving up a, a third round pick, a compensatory third round pick. And they got that pick because Ryan Poles, a minority candidate left them to become the Bears GM. So what that means is that pick will be tacked on to the end of the third round, like the very end after the actual comp picks that teams get for losing free agents. So this is not a super premium third round pick, but it it is a third round pick nonetheless. And we'll see what that means for either Joe Shane rebuilding this roster or perhaps using it as ammo to trade up for a quarterback. We'll see. It's a, it's, a, it's a pick in the top 100-ish, you know, maybe not it quite is. 100, but it's in the 100-ish range. Uh, so, pick. I mean, it's, and, you know, Joe in his in his, in his Meet the Media session uh, on Tuesday, you know, mentioned how he likes to see the top 100 players. So, you you know, he's – that pick really matters to him a lot. Yep, it's it's a premium pick no matter how you slice it, and we'll see what they do with it. I was like just looking at the just bringing it back to the present because we'll see what they do in the future. But I mean, I, quite frankly, I, I was shocked that, <laughs> that they were willing that they were able to give up. I know that it was like a pick that the Chiefs basically got for free, but uh, I was shocked that they were able to get well, you know, the six is one thing, but like to get a third round pick for a guy who has done absolutely nothing in the NFL was shocking to me. Do you as well? Yeah, well, I'm shocked about two things. I'm shocked that um, that they were able to get a, a three and you know and, and an additional six, um, but I'm also shocked that somehow the jo- Joe Shane managed to trade the position, the big, greatest position of weakness on his team, and still have it make sense. That's really hard to do, uh, you know. And it made perfect sense. I mean, because this guy wasn't going to fit into you know he did not fit into any any way, shape, or form to what. Joe Shane and Brian Dable are trying to do uh, with this roster. Uh, you know, they have guys in mind that they like types of players is what I'm saying with, you know, and types of character and, you know, all those things. And Kadarius Tony did not fit into that. And it, they were, I, I just don't think they wanted the, it wasn't really drama, but the, the, um, uncertainty that goes with Kadarius Tony, you know, what's he going to say? What's he going to do? Um, and they got a third round pick for him, knowing that they he he wasn't in their future plans, even though he was not long ago the number twenty overall pick in the draft. 
And, yeah, of course, that pick made by the previous general manager, Dave Gettleman. So Joe Shane really having no loyalty to Kadarius Tony, who was uh, the only thing he was consistent about through a year and a, a season and a half of his NFL career was being undependable and injured. And so, look, I mean, he has some intriguing potential on Andy Reid making this move clearly with the future in mind. You know, this is the guy that they can. It's not like he's a rental player for them. He still has two years left on his rookie contract with the fifth year option available too. So um, they, you know, the, the chiefs making this move with the future in mind and um, Joe Shane able to get rid of a player who was injury prone, undependable. And I think you can look at it and say, well, you know, he's a guy who could have helped them down the stretch um, because they are a little thin at receiver and they are also pushing for a playoff spot. But there's also the chance that he wasn't going to help him because what evidence has he, we've seen, have we seen so far in terms of, number one, his health, and number two, his uh, consistency of production or lack thereof, that he, that he's been, that he's going to be a functional receiver. And so um, if it honestly, like it would be one thing, like if they had moved him for a seventh round pick, it's like, Oh geez, well, why not, why not just like hang on to him, wait and see. But if you're Joe Shane, how can you turn down that offer? Right. For a third round pick. You had to do it. And you know, he he didn't have one guy like that at this moment. He had two guys like that because Kenny Galladay is kind of in that same boat type of thing. What are we going to be able to get out of him? And, and, you know, Joe even mentioned Kenny yesterday after he wasn't able to get a, a, a receiver at the trade deadline that, you know, they're the guy that they're going to add at the trade deadline. And they're hoping as soon as the next game against Houston is Kenny Galladay. Um, you know, is, is that the guy who might have traded for? Probably not. But, you know, that's that that's their best hope for finding somebody who can make some plays for them. Is it is it a faint hope? I, I think so a little bit. Yeah. But, you know, it is a guy who has a track record and has done well before, and it it can't hurt to get him back and see if he can if he can help them. You know, the one thing Kenny Galladay said uh, when he spoke re- most recently was how badly he wanted to play on a good team because he's never played really on a good team. He's, I think his rookie year, the Lions were nine and seven. And after that, they were pretty much battling the Giants for one of the worst records in the league every year. Um, and so we'll see if that's motivation for Kenny Galladay. He he should be motivated because he, he's playing for his next contract too. Yeah, and he he almost certainly will not be here next year. And so um, that it'll be interesting to see what, what happens with Kenny Galladay. But in terms of receivers, the Giants obviously thin there. Um, and now Kadarius Tony's return is not even an option because they traded him away. And so at the trade deadline, Joe Shane did not go out and get anybody. He didn't get anybody, let alone a receiver. So Brandon Cooks stays in Houston. Jerry Judy stays in Denver. Uh, Chase Claypool going from Pittsburgh to Chicago uh, for a second round pick that probably will be fairly high because the Steelers are bad uh, this year and rebuilding. The Packers offered a second for for uh, Claypool. And of course, you know, the Bears look at that and say, well, the Packers are probably going to win a few more games in the Bear than the uh, Steelers this year, so they take they take the uh, they take the Steelers pick in in center. Bears, uh, Bears. Pick. The Steelers take the Bears pick. Who's on first? Right. The Steelers right. take the Bears pick instead of the right. Packers pick. And so, anyway, I honestly like it wouldn't have made sense, quite frankly, for Joe Shane to get rid of a second round pick. Um, well, I mean, even if he even if he tried, he wasn't going to be able to do it because. Correct. It, the, okay. As you're pointing out here, that you know that the, the Giants' pick is going to be not be as good as the Bears' pick. So I, I, I actually got the impression from you know Joe's veiled comments that maybe they did offer a second round pick for for Claypool, and because at one point he said, you know, we, we it only takes one team to come in with a, a you know a better positioning than you to push you out. So I mean, I, I think it's entirely possible that they they made that offer and you know, we're, we're squeezed out of it like the Packers. Interesting point. I mean, that the, being the byproduct, of course, the six and two star, but they'll take six and two over what the bears are looking like right now. And so um, that's sort of what we you know, how the trade deadline shook out in terms of the, of the receiver situation across the league and the giants rolling now with what they have. And you mentioned it with Kenny Galladay, obviously he at least has a track record. Unlike Kadarius Tony, he has not played since October the 2nd against the bears when he hurt his, he hurt his knee and, He's missed four games since, and so uh, you know as you're looking ahead here, the, this next game for the Giants is going to be on uh, uh, November the 13th against the Texans. So that's a that's a significant recovery period. I think um, 
there's no reason that Kenny Galladay can't get back out there sooner rather than later, and they're hopeful that he will, and they really need him to get out there and be productive. I mean, because um, this is not a rebuilding year now. I mean, this is a year for this team to go and, and produce and, 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 and make the playoffs. Right now they have a 77% chance of making the playoffs, according to the – New York Times uh, projection model, and really, if they, if they get to ten wins, they're they're almost certainly in. Um, maybe with nine, uh, but but not a lock there. But in terms of getting guys back, this is an important week, as we mentioned for, for health. Uh, Galladay's one to watch with his knee. It looks like, I would be shocked if Evan Neal came back for for the for the Houston game coming out of the bye week. He's got a knee injury, but that's fairly fresh from from the Jacksonville game. O'Shane Zimenez has got a quad. Injury looks like maybe he he could come back um, after the bye. Richie James got concussed in, in Seattle, of course, fumbled away two punts. Brutal. Uh, we'll see if he if he's even healthy coming out of the bye week or if he still has his job as the Giants punt returner. A couple uh, IR guys that we should touch on here because um, I, I I'd have to let me look at the I, I I should have looked at this in terms of the number of guys who are allowed to return from IR uh, during the course of a season, um, but. The, the the fact remains you must miss f- at least four games to return from IR. So basically um, that means that Ben Bredesen obviously cannot return yet. Aziz Ojolari also cannot return yet coming out of the bye week, but Shane Lemieux can, who knows? I mean, his situation, unfortunately for him has been so injury prone to Aaron Robinson's an interesting one to watch. He had a knee injury he can come back out of the bye week. Well, so if he does come back, what do they do at corner, right? Well, I'll have to sit uh, Odori Jackson. Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a lot of these guys that are that are interesting, I think, for for Aaron Robinson, uh, you know, is Fabian Moreau now the starter at that position? Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt it, to be honest. I mean, they weren't thrilled with Aaron Robinson uh, in, his, in the training camp in the preseason. Uh, he had played okay in the little bit he had played, but it was a, such a small sample size, um, you know. And, and Bredesen's not coming off for a while, but when he does, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't get that job back from Azudu. Uh, you know, they were very happy with the way he played uh, when he when he when he filled in um, a couple weeks ago, and, and I think they were pretty happy with the way he played last week too. Um, you know, so there's there's and that's just the way that things have gone for the Giants where. You know, you can very easily get Wally pipped on this roster where you, um, you know, if you go out for a little bit because the, the the talent level of so many of these guys is so similar. If one of those guys plays well, I can see them going with, the, you know, the hot hand, so to speak. Um, you know, but but just to get some bodies back would be good for them, especially it, Zimenez, the outside linebacker. Aziz isn't eligible yet, but that, that, you know, they need some guys on that outside pass rush to, to really help them. That's been a thing I think they've really been missing in recent weeks. Yeah. As far as Aaron Robinson goes, I mean, he's only played two games this year. He, he, like Kenny Galladay has not played since October the 2nd against the bears. Remember, you know, third round pick just a year ago, but not a Joe Shane third round pick. So uh, I would not be surprised. Like you said, if, if he did not, um, get his job back, you know, but he'll be in the mix. Of course, a young player, I, I'm Brett or Zudu was their pick. You know, he was a third round pick. And so right. I, I'm sure there's some more loyalty there over Bredesen. And um, you mentioned it, uh, how he played in Jacksonville and Seattle. Well, um, getting a lot of snaps in Jacksonville and then uh, starting in Seattle, um, that being a Zudu. Uh, and he, he graded out. I'm looking at his PFF grades. You know, he was, he was much better, uh, much better, especially in pass blocking, um, these past couple weeks. So uh, I'm sure I had, all- a long, I had a long talk with him last week yeah. and he, he just talked about how getting that time to just work on his technique was so helpful to him. Uh, he, he, it, it, it was, he was good to talk to and you know how he, he interestingly, you said Bredesen helped him a lot, just telling him some things about how he could get better. Um, you know, and he, but he talked about being able to work with uh Bobby Johnson and Tony Sperano Jr. And just, you know, make make rather than worrying about, you know, am I going to play or not, just focusing entirely on what he needed to do to be a better offensive lineman. It, you know, you could tell he felt like he was a lot better. Yeah, and in case, you know, people have forgotten, the Giants rotated at left guard Zudu and Ben Bredesen 
Uh, again, again, it's not like Ben Bredesen is some star. Um, so Uzudu could clearly pass him here coming out of the bye. But they rotated the first two games in Tennessee and Carolina, and Uzudu really struggled. And so he didn't play. Uzudu didn't play in, in, the, in week three. And then the next three weeks he played eight, one, and four snaps. So that's what Bob's referring to there, um, that this kid, you know, from week two to essentially week seven basically didn't play um, and was able to develop along the way. And that is that has paid dividends for him here. And I actually just looked it up just to clarify uh, the NFL now allows eight players to return from IR uh, during the course of a season, or you can return guys eight times. So a guy can return twice, but it counts as two of those spots. So uh, I don't know if they've brought back anyone from IR yet. I, well, I, Ellers did, Smith last week they did. Yeah. So, the, but they have some. They have a significant amount of wiggle. Yeah, room. they've got they've got wiggle room for for sure. For for guys like Ben Bradison, for Aziz yeah. Ojolari, Aaron Robinson, and, and like I said, maybe Shane Lemieux, who was going to be the starting left guard. And so, uh, like we said, it's not just about the Kenny Galladay situation, Neil having another week to heal, Zimenez, Richie James. It's about these guys who maybe you guys have forgotten about some of these players like Aaron Robinson who are uh, sitting there on IR, but that's another opportunity for uh, some healing to be done during this extra week, even though, as I said, uh, it doesn't count for the IR situation. You have to miss four games. So the bye week doesn't count as a game. So um, that's where they're at in terms of all those injuries. Another thing that Joe Shane mentioned I thought was interesting, and we can we can kind of recap his his presser with some of the other things that he said now, uh, were, were, was looking ahead to contract extensions. And I thought he had a good approach there. Like if they don't do an extension during the bye week, they're not going to do it for the rest of the year. Makes sense. Uh, the most notable guys are Dexter Lawrence, Daniel Jones, Saquon Barkley. I would honestly be shocked if any of those guys got extensions this week for various reasons. Those things are probably going to be waiting until after the year. Um, there's three lower profile guys there who are pending free agents, Julian Lobo, Shane Zimenez, and Casey Kreider, the long snapper. We'll see on those guys, but uh, that is one thing that Joe Shane mentioned, uh, without mentioning guys by name, really, uh, that extensions could get done this week. I, I, how did you read into that? Well, my, my read was that if they're going to get done, it's going to be that latter group and uh... – not not the former group that you you mentioned. It's not going to be Jones and and Saquon. Uh, that, you know, I I think he you know he made he made it clear that he would like. There's a few guys he would like to get done, uh, and but also while also admitting that you know if if those guys don't want to do it, they they're in no way, shape, or form forced to do it. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if if something uh, something got done, but it's not going to be the big names. It's not going to. It's not going to make the back page of the tabloids. <laughs> no, no. And, and Casey Kreider uh, is an interesting one. Just because I saw well, some team extended their long snapper this week, it, it, during the bye week, rather. It was last week for that team. Um, and Kreider back on a one-year deal this year, which is typically how it works with these long snappers. But, you know, by the time next season starts, he's going to be 33. Um, he's in his, his uh, let's see, 2020. Uh, so this is his third season with the Giants. Um, and so... Uh, anyway, but but that's the type of situation that they could be looking at. Uh, what what else did you uh, did you take away from Joe Shane's uh, rather lengthy press conference yesterday? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think he really tried to get tried to do something the deadline, but it didn't match up. Uh, you know, I, I I think he is really proud of this team, proud of the coaching staff, proud uh, proud of Brian Dables, what they've done. But I don't think his overall view of uh, where the Giants are at and their development changed all that much. Now, he didn't really tip his hand to on and, you know, basically his answer to, well, you know, how do you feel about Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley, which is the, the question surrounding the Giants, uh, was we still got nine games left. Uh, they've played tremendous, really proud of the way they played really happy with the way they played, but tipped his hand in no way, shape, or form uh, whether they're going to be here beyond this year. So, um, you know, that that was the biggest takeaway I had, that he's, he's still – the ultimate scout is still scouting and still evaluating this team. Yeah, great point because, I mean, Joe Shane's job is the bigger picture. I mean, right now, especially now that the trade deadline is done, 
I mean, Joe Shane doesn't really have a significant role in the rest of the season, unless someone gets hurt or whatever, and he has to replace them. But um, the bottom line is this push for 10 wins and this push for the first uh, playoff spot for the Giants since 2016 is in the hands of Brian Dable. Um, Joe Shane is the big picture guy. Um, and so he, it's his job to assess and look at this roster. And let's be honest, the roster is still lacking in talent in a lot of significant areas. Um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about left guard, but you know, the interior line um, is, it has some significant questions, you know, just especially at center. I wouldn't imagine John Feliciano will be back, but there's so many things and uh, that Joe Shane has to, has to think about and address next off season, big and small. And of course the big being, Daniel Jones, Saquon Barkley, uh, what does he do there? And I think it's important to note, you know, people have talked about the franchise tag uh, for one of those guys or the transition tag. And so just just like real quick, you can only use one of those. You, you can't tag both guys in any way, shape, or form. You either use the franchise tag on one guy or the transition tag on one guy. That's it. You get one tag on one player per offseason. So they're going to have to make a decision on Saquon Barkley and Daniel Jones. Do they tag one of them? Who, which one? Or who gets the extension? And how do they shake that out? And so, you know, I would think that they could probably get away with the transition tag, which is cheaper than the franchise tag on Daniel Jones, because uh, there is no compensation that a team gets if another team swoops in and and signs a guy who signed who got the transition tag. But the transition tag is not cheap. I think it's twenty eight million. So who's giving Daniel Jones that much money? So there 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 are certain things that you know certain ways that they could keep certainly obviously keep both of these guys. I mean, look at their salary cap situation for next year. They have about 61 seven uh, in cap space is the projection according to over the cap uh, com, And that's third most in the NFL. So the, the bandaid ripping off that Joe Shane did this off season with getting, uh, getting out from under some of these big contracts and he's going to cut Kenny Galladay and free up some more cap space next off season. Uh, that that's going to pay off. And so that's what he wanted to do was being good cap help next year. So he could actually sign some guys, which he couldn't this year. So um, the rest of this year is about evaluating his own roster, right? It, it, it really is. Uh, and, and you, you mentioned Jones in the transition tag. It's interesting because, if you said if you'd said what you just said at the beginning of the season, nobody's going to pay Daniel Jones twenty eight million dollars. If that's you know if that's if that you know it's going to be in that neighborhood, uh, I was I would have just blanket agreed with you. Uh, I'm not sure I'd agree with you anymore because of the way he's played. Um, you know because there are always teams, especially teams that feel like they can win. Now you're going to get a you're going to get a fifth year guy who kind of has proven himself a little bit as a, a winner, you know, the, the passing numbers are certainly going to, you're going to have to weigh that heavily on where the passing numbers and which the giants are also going to have to weigh heavily. Were they down because he didn't have the wide receivers he needed to, for them to be higher or were they down because he hasn't made that progression yet as a quarterback, um, which if he hasn't made it by this point, Will he ever make it? Uh, there, there's there's a lot of things away, but as you look at some of the teams around the league, you know, and what happened last year, like a, a Marietta going to the the Falcons, a um, Matt Ryan going to the Colts, uh, I, I could see something like a team like that looking and saying, "Hey, you know, maybe Daniel Jones is the guy who can take us to a different level." Uh, based on the way he's played this year. I could see a team saying that. So I don't think it's as blanket as it was at the beginning of the season. Yeah, no, that's that's fair. Um, and, you know, over the cap, again, is a great resource for this. And I'm just just to confirm what I was just kind of spewing off the cuff. The transition tag is projected to be $28 million for, for quarterbacks. And, and what about the franchise tag then? So it's actually not much more. It's 31.4. Um, and that's the... So that's the non-exclusive tag. The exclusive tag is is much more expensive, and so all that means is that, and all that means is that exclusive tag they have no, the player has no ability to go sign with another team. Right. The non-exclusive tag is still pretty darn exclusive because a team would have to give up two first round picks. So we, I think we can agree that no team is going to be giving Daniel Jones that kind of money and giving the Giants two first round picks. That um, is exactly right. I mean, oh, they so that that you know, depending on their own evaluation that would probably be where they would go just to be the safest, I think. Exactly. And they could, they could tag him for 
what amounts to three and a half million dollars more than the transition and be safe about it. And so if you have a lot of cap space like the Giants do, like, why not spend a little more money to be safe about it? And again, just because they franchise tag him um, doesn't mean he's going to just be making 30. Oh, geez, he's going to take up thirty one point four million of his their cap space next year. No, that's not necessarily true because they have until the middle of July to negotiate a long term contract with him. And all the franchise tag does is set the floor for that, meaning, you know, whatever contract he's going to get is going to have at least 31 for and fully guaranteed money in it. Um, And they could structure that so that they can kind of spread it out and for cap purposes. And anyway, but that's sort of where they stand with all that. But like we've said here, geez, there's still nine games left in the season for things to go either much better, the same or much worse than they've gone for. Saquon Barkley and Daniel Jones, which the upshot being they're not getting extensions this week. <laughs> they're definitely not getting, they're still evaluating. That's essentially what it is. So yeah. as we, we did look, obviously looking forward quite a bit there, um, but let's bring it back here and look forward to what the giants have coming up because, you know, I know giants fans certainly care about the Jones and Barkley contract situation, but they also look, this is not just about, again, not about forward-looking and not about rebuilding. We haven't talked one lick about the draft. Um, I haven't visited Tankathon <laughs> like one time this year to look at the Giants' draft position. That More- website misses you, Daryl. It misses you. <laughs> and you know what? I'll go, give them, I'll go give them a click right now. But, uh, I mean, I've been on this New York Times uh playoff percentage site much more and like i said 77 percent chance to make the playoffs which is down a bit from coming out of the the jacksonville game which makes sense but still at six and two and the push for 10 wins uh the giants currently like if if the season ended today we'll do one of those things they are the sixth seed in the nfc so the second of the three wild card spots and um so that's what this that's what these final nine games is really most immediately about trying to make the playoffs and um they go Texans and Lions coming out of the bye week. They should and both those games at home. There's no reason they should not go two and two and zero. Oh, correct in that stretch. Not not only that, they're must wins. I mean, they they have to win those games uh, if they're. I think if they're going to make the playoffs, I think they really need to probably win both of them. Even though the the, the even though the NFC is what are there one two. Three, I think there are five total four, winning four teams. teams with winning records right now. Well, yeah, four four teams with winning record. One, two, three, four. No, five. I'm sorry, five teams with winning records. Five teams with winning records. But then you look at it, you know, like a team like the 49ers who just got McCaffrey and are feeling pretty good about themselves. The Rams are defending Super Bowl champs. Uh, you never know if the Packers will, will get it together. Um, you know, the, the same. You know, there are enough teams in there that. And I haven't even looked at their schedules, uh, but the Giants' schedule gets pretty tough after these first two games. So you you better take advantage of what's in front of you immediately. If they lose one or both of these games, all the wiggle room we talked about is gone. Honestly, I mean that the six and one start gave them quite a bit of wiggle room, and um, they used up a little bit of that by losing in Seattle. And again, there's no shame in losing that game. And um, But you alluded to it after home against Houston, home against Detroit, the Giants go short week down to Dallas for the Thanksgiving game, uh, extremely challenging game. And then uh, the month of December certainly looks tough for this team because they have to play and not in this order, but we'll just, I'll just kick out the order right now. They go Washington, Philadelphia, Washington, Minnesota with those latter two on the road. Um, Obviously everyone knows what the Eagles and Vikings have done this year. They've been outstanding. Um, Washington's an interesting one, right? I mean, they don't look quite as maybe inept as you'd think they would <laughs> considering their quarterback situation, but they're four and four. I mean, they're, they're not a they're playoff hunt too now. <laughs> sure. What's that? They're in the playoff hunt now too. I mean, they're looking at the so. and saying, we can make the playoffs. <laughs> Very much so. I mean, we talked about the, you know, just because the NFC only has those five teams with winning records, there is a gap right now between uh, the Giants at six and two and the sixth seed and the Niners at four and four and the seventh seed. But there's a little bit of a log jam after that, you know, Washington four and four and the Rams at three and four and the Bucks even at three and five Packers three and five. So they're all right there. I mean, those are competent teams um, that have the ability to go get that third and remember now three wild card spots. And so, and after that, the Giants will finish versus Colts and add Eagles in the final two games, both of those in January. But um, 
again, the next the five games that come after Houston and Detroit for this Giants team are all either somewhat challenging, those being the Washington games, or extremely challenging, Dallas, Philly, Minnesota, right? Absolutely. Um, and and this is a league where you, you can't, you know, just because they're playing the, the, the Texans and the and the uh, Lions doesn't mean that these are going to be easy wins either in this league. I mean, the Texans on, in a lot of weeks, like they, they went to Jacksonville and won 13 to six. They gave up six points to that team that, that, and, and really gashed the, the had really gashed the giants and on defense without scoring a lot of points. Uh, you know, and last week against the Titans, they lost 17 to 10. Uh, they, they gave up 10 or 17 points to, you know, played him central is very much the way the Giants played him. So it, it's not like these games are, you, you check them off as definite wins. They, the Giants have to go, you know, coming out of a bye, they should beat the Houston Texans, but it's not, it's not a gimme. Yeah, they absolutely should. I mean, if this is a, if this is a team that wants to make the playoffs, then that's a game that they have to win. There's no doubt about it. But I, I think it's important to remember here that this is still a team. This is still a team with a flawed roster, and still a team that has basically the same roster that we, and if you know, if not more dinged up than what we saw earlier this year. Um, and so, the, the only thing different about it is what Joe Joe Shane mentioned yesterday. Is a, he, they lead the league in guys who weren't here when the season started in September and are, have contributed to this team. You know, between between the rookies and those guys, that's one of the amazing parts of this six and two story is that so many rookies and so many guys who weren't even on the roster when the season started have been played contributing factors to the six and two start. And that's coaching. I mean, that gets back to coaching and Brian Dable and his staff have done an outstanding job. And, um, you know, you mentioned the Texans and I, as you were talking about that, I just looked at the lions, obviously, you know, my gosh, you talk about it, an inept franchise overall, but like uh, they're one in six this year. And so they, they have gotten hammered in a couple of games. They lost to the Patriots by 29. They lost to the Cowboys by 18, but last week lost to the dolphins by four. They lost to Seattle by three. They lost to Minnesota in Minnesota by four, and they lost to the Eagles only by three to start the season. They beat Washington for their lone win by nine points. So uh, again, like if you look at the the Lions and think like, oh, of course, you know the stigma attached to the Lions in general, but also one in six, um, they you know, Jared Goff stinks. But um, but you know, look, they played two of the best teams in the entire league in the in the Eagles, and then they go to Minnesota and they played those games very close. So um, the, and so that, that, that kind of, you, you see why Dan Campbell is saying that they're, that they're close, you know, to kind of getting another win. But uh, of course, Lions got to go play the Packers this week. My gosh, if, if Green Bay loses that game, whoo. So, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's another, uh, that's another story, but uh, uh, let's, let's wrap this up by, we do a prediction obviously here at the end of every, every week, unless there's anything you else wanted to touch on here, Bob, anything else? I, I, think, I think we've covered it all there. I I if I'm wrong, I've been wrong before, <laughs> but we do a, end with a prediction every, uh, and there's no game. So in every podcast, we usually end with a prediction. So the giants are six and two right now. There's nine games left. Um, we're not going to go Mike, Mike and the mad dog style week by week here, but um, how about, what what will the Giants' final record be? Give me give me your prediction for what their final record will be after their seventeenth regular season game ends on January the eighth. Well, as I said before, I picked them to win five at the start of the season, which I was right because they've won six, and so they definitely won five. Um, I, I I'm going to try to I'm going to use this as a mulligan, but I think they're going to finish eleven and six. So what would that have them going three and four in the second half? Uh, no, five and five and four. I'm sorry. Way five. Off. <laughs> um, yeah, you told me there's gonna be no math uh, five five and four in the second half i can i can see him winning these first two games out uh and i can see him beating the commanders or the, the commanders once the, the lions and i could i'm also looking at it and saying that last game might not mean anything to the eagles uh which could which would be kind of ironic the way the, the 2020 season ended in a, in a really good nfc east they're going to get to play the Eagles with the game not meaning anything to the Eagles in the last game. When you look back at 2020 and the the uh, Jalen Hurts bench bowl, yeah, oh yeah, 
That would be an interesting way to finish the season. Yeah, and Joe Judge, you know, throwing a tantrum there as a result of that. First, as it turned out, of many tan- tantrums for Joe Judge. But um, yes, no, uh, or the Eagles, or the Eagles could be going for seventeen and zero, and so maybe it won't mean anything unless it means something. Uh, we'll see. Uh, Thursday night in Philly, the Phillies could win the World Series, and the Eagles could start eight and zero for the first time in, in franchise history. Uh, so grease up those light poles. Uh, well, the, 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 I, I never thought. The, that you'd have two Philadelphia Houston games and the one that the people in Philadelphia cared about and Houston would be the Phillies and Astros. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <in November. laughs> so. exactly. Um, I'll go 10 and seven. I'll say the giants close. Um, what would that be? Is what I, or I said 11 and six, right? You said 10 and seven. Okay. Yeah. 11 and six for you. 10 and seven. So the four and five, those four wins being the next two, I'll give them one against the Commanders, and then I'll give them the Colts game uh, because obviously they're going with Sam Ellinger there, uh, which I don't think that's altogether surprising. You know, one against the Commanders, I'll say the home game, um, and then Texans, Lions, Colts. So those are games that they should win if you look at the final stretch, and then they'll lose all the games they quote unquote should lose. So a four and five finish after a six and two start, still ten and seven. I would be very surprised if that did not get them into the playoffs, especially in this year's NFC. Um, but that's what um, – and no, I don't think the Eagles will finish 17-0. I do think the Phillies will win the World Series. So, uh, <laughs> with that said, uh, do you, hey, Phillies, are they going to win it? Yes or no? Um, yeah, they're going to win it. I, 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 think they're, I think they're just destined to, to win this. Yeah. And they and they have a real home field advantage that I didn't see coming, but it's there. What, will they win it in five, six, or seven? I think they win it in five. I don't think they let the I don't think they let the Astros drag them back to Houston. Okay, all right. I, I'll say six. I'll say six. My friend of mine who's a Phillies fan lives in Houston, has tickets to Game Six, so uh-huh. I'm hoping he gets to see them clinch it in Houston. Uh, on that would be Saturday night because it got pushed ahead. So with all that said, uh, appreciate everyone listening. As always, be sure to rate, review, subscribe to us on all your uh, podcasting platforms. And we will be with, uh, we'll be back with you guys next week. Um, and maybe uh, won't have quite as much to talk about because there's no game on Sunday. But enjoy uh, whatever you guys are doing uh, this weekend in terms of uh, the Giants being off, whether that's uh, watching other teams or just uh, just hanging out. So. Uh, Thanks again, everyone, for joining us, and we will talk to you guys next week.